a lot of people are talking about epigenetics these days. Mm. Let's first say what it is and then say whether it's a revolution or just a minor change on our previous mm. views. Yeah, so epigenetics is the idea that you inherit other chemical messages than the DNA when you're the sperm and the egg come together to form a fertilized egg. There's a whole bunch of genes, but there's a whole bunch of other chemical messages that are being transmitted, and that those evolve just like genes. I mean, some of those are sitting on the DNA, and they ex determine what's expressed and what's not. Yeah, so some biologists will say, look, really epigenetics is actually just the, f the chemical groups that are physically attached to the DNA, and yeah. other biologists will include other molecules that are floating around in the cytoplasm, and it doesn't really matter which way you talk. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But this is a new view, really. We weren't mm -hmm. aware of epigenetics until the last decade or so, is that yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, indeed. And I think it's a nice example of the, uh, actually the power of genetic technology. Because these, I mean, one of the reasons we can explore this stuff is actually because we've got gene sequencing. So the classic these days, you, if you're trying to find these other molecules, you basically do it starting with the DNA because we have so much control and access over that. Mm -hmm. um, so. And now we can actually measure which parts of the genome are imprinted in ways that are not expressed. Yeah. Which is, you can actually identify the genetic markers of epigenetics. And mentioning imprinting, I mean, that's that, that extremely uh, we, we exciting. We should say what that is. Indeed, what, the what extremely, is it? it's the extremely exciting idea that uh, if you have a gene from your mother or a gene from your father, the gene can be behave quite differently and have quite a different effect on your phenotype, on your body. What's an example of imprinting, influencing things? Well, so uh, for example, there are genes that you'll get a copy of from your, uh, there's a, uh, a gene, um, what's well, insulin-like growth factor two, to give it its technical name. We're going to David Hainsworth. Indeed, yeah. And I mean, this is a really interesting gene because it regulates the speed at which fetuses grow. And if you get a copy from your mother, it'll be turned off, and if you get, a, I think it's the right way around, if you get it from right. your father, you'll be turned on, right. um, which shows that it's a gene a is not a gene. A gene is a gene with a bunch of other stuff is attached to it. Is that just an accident, or do, you, do do paternal genes get some advantage from making the baby bigger faster? Well, that's, that's what theory would suggest. Theory would suggest that this is, mothers and fathers might not quite agree on what would be the comfortable growth, the comfortable rate of growth that's going to serve their interests most, and that's the mother has to deal with a whole bunch of other issues. She's going to have other children, for example, she in the future. She wants to save some calories for the next one. Indeed, and she's also got her own, you know, maybe, uh, I mean, from a biological point of view, she may be more concerned about her own health than her husband is. Having a baby that's too large could kill her, Indeed. among other things. Indeed, and yeah. cause uh, diseases of pregnancy like preeclampsia, for example. So, uh, yeah, this is a really interesting field. I mean, it shows that inheritance is is real biology. Inheritance is complex biological systems with many parts interacting. It's not just, you know, Mendel's, Mendel's laws that we all learned when so we were at college. It's not just the genes getting transmitted from parent to child. It's the genes plus a lot of marks on them and possibly other things. And evolution playing with all of this and having different ways of implementing evolutionary strategies. That's, I think, the interesting perspective. Mm. So let's spend just one more minute on this talking about why it might be beneficial for the genes that come through a father to induce faster growth in the mm -hmm. fetus. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is this general topic that uh, everybody wants, there are three actors involved in pregnancy. There's the mother, the father, and the baby. And they all want the baby to survive and to flourish and reach reproductive maturity. But they might not agree on exactly how much resources they want to invest in that, mm -hmm. or what other risks of other things happening they're prepared to incur. Um, and so, I mean, think about this in terms of, uh, um, for example, uh, suppose you're, um, you're just together with somebody, this is the first time you've had a child together, then you know, you're not sure that the next child will be your child if you're the man, whereas if you're the woman, you're very sure the next <laughs> child will be your child. Right, right. So when we talk about spreading risk over several children, we're going to have very different views about that. Mm -hmm. I'm the man, I might think, well, you know, if, you, if it's, I think there's actually some evidence uh, in the epidemiology literature for this that uh, um, after you've had a number of children together, and that's reflected at a chemical level in the immunological response of one body to the other, you've had several children together, uh, we see things that reflect the fact that now you're really on the same team in a way that you weren't when you mm -hmm. had the first one. Um, so, for example, the risk of death through this disease, uh, very tragic disease, preeclampsia, which fortunately we don't 
see manifesting in, um, in uh, the death of mother and child anymore, but historically was a huge cause of uh, the death of both mother and fetus, the risk of that disease plummets as you have more and more children with the same guy. Let's go on to in a minute and talk more about preeclampsia. Mm -hmm.